Uh, this is um, something I've been looking forward to uh, after his press office. The um, professor was doing part of his Glasgow University, but he's also the leadership fellow in digital humanities for the Arson Humanities Research Council. Um, and he is one of the great luminaries in this relatively new uh, field of investigation. And um, we we all had a drink when he accepted the invitation to come to talk to us. And uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome him. He's just called his talk Digital Transformations, Professor Andrew Pasta. that work in using computers um, to deal with the sorts of primary material that we're all concerned with in the humanities goes back to the 1940s. But generally, we trace the beginnings of digital humanities to the work of Father Robert Busa um, with uh, IBM in the 19, late 1940s um, to help compile an index to the works of Thomas Aquinas. So the concepts have been around a long time, but actually the underlying concepts aren't that different to a lot of what Alexander has been talking about. Um, and, uh, I mean, insofar as I had any technical understanding, which is very limited, it's really because I used to work at the British Library, and I tend to see things in terms of library catalogs. So a lot of what Alexander uh, uh, was saying has really resonated with me, particularly the use of British National Bibliography. And I wouldn't say that we can say there are as much a prescribed set methods for digital humanities um, as, as so much a willingness to, to use technology of every different type. And I'll try to indicate it goes beyond databases and data sets in some of the examples I'll show you. But to use technology of every different type to explore every different facet of the humanities. My starting point with digital humanities is as a, a, a medieval historian, a manuscript person, and I'm interested in how far can we use different lighting techniques, image enhancement techniques, um, in order to investigate manuscripts. And I, I was terribly late in preparing this because I got sidetracked by whether we could actually see some details in the manuscript of Chaucer using a new imaging method, um, which, was, which was very interesting. So it's very wide ranging. And um, an important point, I think, in thinking about where the AHRC, for whom I do the bulk of my work at the moment, fit into this, um, is that increasingly digital methods are there through virtually every aspect of the research funded by the AHRC. See, it's difficult to actually, um, actually categorize it separately. It used to be very handy 10 years ago we could put it as a sort of separate, slightly curious field of activity. Um, but now, it, it, the use of digital technology is permeates everything, and it's rather inescapable. So um, when the AHRC was thinking about how it shaped its support um, uh, for uh, uh, digital humanities, it used this term digital transformation. But I'd just like to look at how this sort of fits in for the pattern. So I think it, it helps to understand the landscape the AHRC decided that it needed some wider overarching themes in its support for research in arts and humanities in Great Britain. And following the consultation in 2010, it decided that there would be sort of four overarching themes. Not all research would be tied to these, but there would be themes to which the AHRC felt in response to its community it could give a certain amount of attention. And these themes were science in culture, translating cultures, care for the future, and then finally digital transformations. And obviously there's a lot of cross-connections um, between those themes. Um, I work very closely with my colleague, who's the theme leader fellow um, for science and culture, Professor Barry Smith, at the Institute of um, uh, Philosophy uh, in the School of Advanced Studies. Central University of London. 
And there's obviously cross connections when we're thinking about care for the future, when we're thinking about, say, archival issues. So there are a lot of cross connections, and there are connections with other programs. Um, there's a big program called the Connected Communities Program. And some of the projects that I'll be showing you are, are, are cross connected with that. Also, interestingly, and I, I always mention this now because I think there's a sort of misapprehension about it. One of the biggest digital uh, research programs in the UK at the moment is called the Digital Economy. And I think in the arts and humanities, we get a bit wrong footed by that because we see digital economy and we think it's all about, you know, SMEs making money from simple uh, startups and things like that. It isn't. Economy here is interpreted in the widest possible sense of digital activity. And I'm sure, certainly, um, in the area of the study of music, there's a great deal that comes up that would actually fit under the digital um, economy banner. So that's another area of interest. You'll gather that this is perhaps less tightly coordinated and directed than some of the special programs the NHRC has had in the past. It's had, for example, some years ago a program on religion and society, and another one, Beyond Text, which were very firmly directed and had program directors who were engaged in strategic programs. This is slightly vaguer. It's a sort of expression of an area of interest of the AHRC. And similarly, my role as a team leader fellow isn't really, I think sometimes people think I'm the program director and I decide what gets funded. Um, it isn't. It's really to actually provide a sense of the emerging landscape um, and the overall intellectual shape of the thing and to build overarching narratives to get a sense of what's going on. Important to emphasize within that that this isn't the AHRC's only digital activity. Digital activities are very widespread in the AHRC now, and um, they often come out with the normal, standard, responsive mode grants that we have in the AHRC. But many of them, like the Listening Experience Database project, have a profound digital component. So there's been a shift already, um, and in a sense that's reflected in our theme of digital transformations. So what do we mean when we're talking about digital transformation? I think what we're looking for with this program, and this is a kind of issue when we're thinking about things like the development of, of the AD, um, what takes us a stage further than what we were doing 10 or 15 years ago? We knew about the structure of relational databases, like the 1960s really, um, but some of the technology that Alessandro is describing um, to, uh, about linking um, and indeed, particularly the use of existing databases, that's a relatively new area of interest. So, at one level, we're looking for the potential of those new sorts of approaches to transform research in the arts and humanities. So that's one aspect of what we're doing with digital transformations. With the other, we're, it's increasingly evident that when we think about privacy, identity, uh, intellectual property, the way in which data and digital methods are pervading our everyday life are beginning to pose some very profound moral, ethical, social questions. And the HRC also feels that there's an arts humanities perspective to bring to bear here, and part of our role is to bring that, that perspective to bear. So, what have we been doing? NHRC is a research council, so it's in the business of offering money to support uh, uh, these activities. And since uh, really the thing of going in 2011 was a theme, there have been a variety of activities. A number of small grants in 2012 across the range of the whole theme were very effective. It's interesting to me how often it's actually not the big grant that makes the difference. It's a small grant that shows them what can be done. And that was certainly the case with the smaller grants at the very beginning of the project. But at the heart of the project are uh, very large grants of awards, some £2 million over four years, um, to three major projects which we'll look at in a bit more detail at the moment. The Digital Panopticon, Fragmented Heritage, and a project particularly relevant here, Transforming Musicology. We also got I think you could almost say sidetracked by the big data agenda, which maybe had a certain amount of hype about it, but it's nice because uh, the hype encourages governments to give you money. 
Um, and uh, that certainly resulted in some very interesting big data uh, uh, activities in the past couple of years due to a special tranche of money made available um, by the uh, uh, made available by, by the Department of Innovation and Science. Um, there's some further small grants, including a competition which is closing shortly next week, unfortunately, um, but one where practice-based research is getting some prominence. And also, I should finally mention a major study on the future of the academic book, which is really a sort of intelligence gathering exercise to see what's going on out there, um, which UCL and King's College London are undertaking um, for the AHRC um, with uh, the British Library. So there's been a raft of activities. Give you a sense of what that amounts to. I can't do any better than actually look at some of the projects. So let's look very quickly at the three beacon projects, as we call them, the ones that really uh, bear the weight of what we hope this team activity will achieve. The first, again, harks back to some of what we've already heard about these data technologies. One of the most influential historical data technologies in recent years um, has been the proceedings of the Old Bailey, um, which put online in a very searchable, um, very manipulable um, format um, uh, trials of about 66,000 people um, who were uh, sentenced at the Old Bailey. What this project is going to do is to take that material and then, well, in the 18th century, if they were sentenced at the Old Bailey, they were often transported to Australia. And what this will do is look at the records in Australia, try and link them with the Old Bailey records, and see what happened to those people after um, after they left Britain and uh, settled in Australia. So it's using linked data on a vast scale to answer some big questions. And they're not just historical questions, they're actually um, questions about how we deal with this sort of linking on a large scale. And then beyond that, what sort of social questions we can answer with it about the way in which punishment works. Um, was transportation an effective way of building up Australia society, what sort of policy implications for the nature of punishment we will take from that. So that's one that's dealing with linked data. Second project is an archaeological project called Fragmented Heritage, um, where crowdsourcing comes in, and again one wonders about the, the term, but it's basically getting a lot of volunteer helpers in um, to help archaeologists identify where fragments can be found on very large scale sites. Some of the sites are important in the early history of human evolution are town sites. And trying to work out where fragments are scattered across those is a very difficult process. So this project will be using drones in order to get high resolution images of sites in Africa, or the Near East and elsewhere, and um, uh, will be inviting volunteers to work out where um, uh, the fragments occur. Um, so that's again the use of uh, crowdsourcing techniques. Um, but it's then hoped that it will be possible um, to develop an automated method to reintegrate those fragments. Another big problem um, with archaeological fragments is that refitting and putting them together um, is a very time consuming task. But it's hoped to actually automate that and speed up what we can do um, with these large scale sites. So um, not only will this experiment with new technologies, but also hope it will scale up what archaeologists are able to do and enable them to deal with a much larger picture um, than they've hitherto been able to do. So that's imaging, crowdsourcing. So that, again, that gives you a sense of some of the key techniques. The final one, for which the principal investigator is Professor Tim Crawford at Goldsmiths College, is called Transforming Musicology. And it's really building on the work that many of you might be more familiar with than me, that's taken place in recent years, um, whereby it's possible to manipulate scores and read scores in the way we got used to uh, with reading texts. Um, and uh, the website there um, gives a uh, um, uh, gives a very Production to find what's going on. 
This is unlike the others, what you might call a portfolio project, in the sense that it's a large-scale project dealing, consisting of a number of small mini-projects, uh, which range from looking at loop music and how loop music can be represented on the web, right the way through to the club and even current um, uh, electronic music. Um, and uh, it's interesting because of uh, the range of uh, uh, projects involved. And um, it will be looking at the variety of musical information retrieval tools that are available, but also engaging in all sorts of other very exciting event at uh, Birmingham this weekend, where the team from the project have been using neuroscience techniques to analyze audience reactions to Wagner. Um, yeah, and uh, they'll be having a, a workshop with Colin Blakemore, um, the, the former head of the Medical Research Council, uh, to look at some of the results of that uh, this Saturday. But I wouldn't, I'd stress that it doesn't simply amount this program to those three projects. It's really looking at a wide range of things. Some small project is almost one day. The linking of data, as we've heard, um, is increasingly important. Um, because classicists have been very much to the forefront of adopting some of these technologies, um, uh, a very large number of uh, the recorded population of the classical world are actually out there in digital form. And this project, SNAP, is actually looking at how you can integrate the variety of data sets that we've got to get an overview of the population of the classical world. Other data sets have been around for a while, but they're reaching the point where you can start to do very interesting things with them. This is a team based at the University of Glasgow, where I'm, I'm currently based, um, and uh, it's using the historical thesaurus of the Old English Dictionary um, in order to look at shifts in meaning. Um, we're used to the idea that words in dictionaries can be databases, and um, uh, the, the, we can actually search texts much more readily than we're available, than we're able to. What we're not used to so much to doing is searching for meanings. Um, is actually looking at those changes in meaning and how you distinguish between a search for a cricket pitch against a search for a uh, pitcher's tar, um, and what those shifts in meaning, how that works, uh, this tool is looking at. So this is kind of looking at the textual elements um, um, of it. it. It doesn't exclusively take an interest in texts. Um, this problem, this uh, project at the University of Brighton is looking at issues uh, with documenting semantic level meanings and deeper uh, levels um, uh, with film. We're also having projects which experiment with some of the completely new technologies that are coming along. A couple of projects, including this one at the University of Bangor, um, are looking at the 3D modeling of archaeological artifacts and indeed the printing of them, um, and how printing and those new material technologies can transform um, some of our engagements. And that actually leads across to uh, thinking about artistic and creative work um, in the digital sphere, um, which uh, uh, a number of projects are doing some interesting work on. One I particularly like is a book, is a project called Transforming Artist Books, um, which is looking at the way um, in which uh, artists are starting to use digital technology to express their reaction to present book material. Um, and uh, <coughs> the, uh, the engagement of artists with books is very important in this um, area. But what are all these amount of what are projects, a lot of activity, a lot of methods? Does it actually amount to a change? And we frequently hear, um, oh, I'll skip that, comparatively apocalyptic um, comments like this one from an engineer at Veriton, who compares the Gutenberg Bible, uh, the Puritan Gutenberg Bible, to uh, the arrival of the Reformation, and suggests we're about to undergo the Digital Industrial Revolution, which is going to make the Gutenberg Bible uh, look like nothing. Um, and it makes one immediately wonder what earth is going to be rolling down the hill at us when we think of the Reformation uh, and the 30 years war. Is this going to be even worse? What's going to happen? 
And this idea of disruption is a very popular one. We tend to think that what's going on is something like the way in which the Industrial Revolution was depicted at the Olympic Games in 2012. Somebody in the middle of the green and pleasant land, that region is kind of shooting up, and everything has changed utterly. And it was interesting, I heard Michael Shempel, one of the pioneers of the web, um, uh, making this exact parallel um, in the talk on Saturday. We think everything is about to be shattered uh, forever. That's particularly pertinent here because this idea of digital disruption, the classical example of it, is always given as the music recording industry, uh, which is seen as something that has been disrupted by the arrival of new technologies and leading <coughs> to major commercial uh, changes. And this term that the HRC picked up on, digital transformations, is interesting because it relates specifically to these concerns. Management books urge firms to actually engage in a process of digital transformation to look out for the changing technologies to avoid the fate of HMV or Jessup or Comet. Suggestion is that unless you keep renewing your digital engagement, um, you're going to go the way of those firms. So the, the suggestion is that the process of change is a sudden one, a disruptive one, one that maybe is technology-led. And I wonder from some of the examples we've talked about, and indeed where we think about um, uh, some of the data that's determined in the listening experience database, feeding back to um, library catalogs, which go back to the 19th century, but well, it's actually a more gradual process than we sometimes allow for. It's very intriguing to note that this is actually the view of the little marking of Brunel, very interesting quote by him, that the, the most useful and novel inventions are mere progressive steps in a highly wrought and highly advanced system dependent on other previous steps. And if one looks at the history of industrialization, there's some very good examples of that. One, of course, being the steam engine, which wasn't sort of invented by James Watt out of nowhere, um, but one of the most uh, potent artifacts of the University of Glasgow um, is a model of a steam engine invented by a man called Newcomer in the 17th century, which Watt was repairing for the university when he got the idea of a separate condenser which would make it more powerful, and which, after a considerable amount of trial and error, uh, leads to its deployments in factories in Birmingham. So it's a progressive step. And indeed, it's recently been pointed out that Steve Jones is sort of the great figure of the moment in terms of thinking about digital disruption. Actually, a lot of his success was in tweaking and improving things. Um, uh, the iPod wasn't the first MP3 player but it was much more reliable, much more compact, strongly designed, it was tweaked. Similarly with the iPhone. It wasn't the first phone of its type, but it was uh, put together in such a way that it worked very effectively. So maybe it's about tweaking. Um, maybe it's in the transformation exists in looking for different areas. And if we're thinking about how we're going to take this forward in a scholarly context, maybe we shouldn't be looking for the large scale disruptive uh, element, um, but uh, we should be looking for um, looking for tweaking. This digital transformation term actually refers back to the disruptive models of a management guru called Christensen. And it actually puts it wrongly because it makes it sound as if technology always disrupts. And actually what Christensen argues is that the people who innovate are disrupted by the cheap replicators a little later. So in his view, Mac is disrupted by Mac, and that's exactly what's happening. So in the arts of humanity, should we be thinking of innovation as normal process of incremental development? Sort of thing we've already heard about. And that may have lessons for some of the wider things that we think about in terms of making the case for the importance of arts and humanities uh, economically and socially. So what sort of themes, that's what I'd like to finish up with, what sort of themes have come out of the work so far, overarching things, that might suggest ways forward of development? Well, one striking thing, I think, is materiality. 
When we started out on this uh, project, we thought of data in very much uh, the way in which Alejandro has presented it to you. There's a lot of data there. We can link it, we can chop it up, we can slice it up, we can move it in different directions, we can do all sorts of things with it. We can turn it into pictures, uh, we can even turn it into sound, we can do all sorts of things with data. But as we started out on the theme, we realized that sort of coming down the road matters um, were um, actually aspects of materiality and the, uh, the role of design and the role of the artist was actually very important in that. One of the earliest projects that we financed under the theme was a project of Professor Ian Gwilt at um, uh, Sheffield Callum University for printing out and turning into art objects data visualizations. And that's interesting both as a way of looking at making data more haptic and manageable, but also turning it into something that is in itself an art and creative object. Also very fascinating and uh, um, the way in which ideas around the internet of things are starting to feed into this. Um, another project with the theme is called Tangible Memories. And the idea is, um, it's simply to help with care of the elderly, that you can take an Internet of Things method um, and attach a, uh, a, a QR code or an audio file to a cake stand. Remember, you've got the cake stand from your great grandmother. And that this can be useful in care. This is a setup of a tangible memories room that was in an exhibition um, in Cardiff. Photographs can have information attached to them. But then that changes their nature as artifacts. So they are they archival objects? What are we, when we categorize them, I'm used to thinking of archival being texts. Where do we fit that in? Poses a lot of interesting issues. And then there are things like conductive ink. The thing of ink as being the ultimate analog thing, ink has been dead and buried. I've virtually given up writing. Uh, in using out by the keyboard all the time. But then um, uh, we get an ink that can conduct electricity. So with an ink that can conduct electricity, um, suddenly um, you're able to um, uh, use ink and paper to make circuits. Uh, uh, a PhD student at the University of Sunday has produced a pair of paper headphones, which worked perfectly well. This was an event that we did um, and we'll see if this works at um, Cheltenham, but it was also exhibited in Vienna, of a sculpture, a sound sculpture, made using um, uh, uh, conductive ink. So it's a tapestry, um, and you can run your hand on the tapestry and uh, hear a sound playing. And the metaphor is that it's like breathing life into the skin, and the sound that occurs you can hear is like having skin breathe again. Let's see if we can get this going on a bit. The thing is a bit doubtful with the, with the internet connection here, so I'm not sure how far we're going to get to that. So I'm going to get to this. Let's see if it's working together. Let's see if it's a good iPhone. I'll have a go. Well, you can get the idea um, that if we do a, um, a search on, on contours, um, and the artist is called Fabio Antinori, there's a reference there if you want to do it. I'll put these up on slide share later. You can explore this sound sculpture um, at a greater length. Early on in, the, um, uh, in, in our event, we had um, uh, an event called the Digital Transformation Moot. Uh, we call it a moot because we didn't want to make it a workshop or a conference. A uh, moot is an Anglo Saxon word for a gathering. And uh, we concluded with a concert by Imogen Heap, who's been working on another AHRC funded uh, project 
um, which um, is producing musical gloves. Um, these are gloves which, I will attempt to get this going, maybe we'll be luckier with this one, um, which allow her to control um, the sounds that she makes while she's singing. This just simply may not work. And, and they, no, 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 we, too much in the rafters to get this going effectively. What I'll do is I'll put these, oh no, no, these slide up on slide chair, and I'll just talk you through them now, and then you can explore the links at your leisure. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put the, anybody who uses Twitter, um, my um, Twitter tag is at AJ Prescott, and I'll put that up there, and I'll also pass it on to Helen. So, um, Imogen Heap, has produced these remarkable glass that allow her to control um, the way in which background sound is made as she's singing. So the pitch can go up and down as she moves her hands, it can change as she moves them in another direction, um, and it frees her. And what interests me with that is the way in which performance and engineering and sound all collide together to create something that's very different. And it's, again, that incremental transformation that I think um, is very uh, uh, interesting um, uh, uh, from that, uh, uh, from that point of view. The kind of way in which we're starting to think about putting things together in different configurations is very well illustrated by another HSE-funded project, which is the West Hales Totem Pole of Memory. Fundamentally, it's a totem pole in the west coast of Scotland that was developed as a community project, and the QR codes that you can see on the totem pole link to community memories. So it's an archive in itself. It's an archive as a totem pole. And um, uh, you can point your phone at the totem pole and view the memories. And again, it's interesting the sort of rethinking the boundaries uh, between text, sound, archive, and reshaping that. So, an interesting area with this is what you might call recollecting, rethinking the way in which our collection of this material uh, or, and how we engage with them. When we started with digitization, we really emphasized access. It's all about the opening up the collections in museums, and archives, and galleries for wider access. We started to realize, that actually, as we do that, we're rethinking the way in which we see the structure of the archives and the boundaries of the way in which they work. And that's another major theme that's coming through here. And the examples that you'll be able to explore later, and I'm sorry we can't do it here, um, I might just try and find the one if we get to that to so keep my fingers crossed on it. But let's see what happens. Um, the um, uh, examples I've got here that illustrate that seem to be particularly pertinent to our discussions today because they're very much about sound. And one of the issues I think that's confronting those of us in areas like humanities and literature is that suddenly we've got access to much more multimedia content than we had in the past. Um, uh, as a historian, whilst I was aware of and conscious of the work of oral history, it was a separate thing. I tended to concentrate on texts in archives I had enough problems dealing with those, thank you. Um, and uh, let the oldest one get on with their thing. But increasingly, as we're able easily to access different types of multimedia content, I'm going to start thinking about how sound, how film fits into what I do with history, how I put history together. 
very good example of this, I thought, um, is that one of the most familiar sites when I was looking at this library, I went past it every morning, was the wonderful 7th century Lindus Farm Gospels uh, on display in the British Library. And when the Lindus Farm Gospels were recently exhibited in, uh, recently exhibited in, in Durham, um, there was a piece of work by the sound artist Chris Watson, who used field recording techniques in order to recreate the soundscape of Lindus Farm in the 7th century. His interpretation, of course, which he's now issued with the the album, and you can hear an extract from this SoundCloud uh, link. Um, and it raises a lot of questions to me as to where that fits into my understanding of Lindisfarne. Would I have been conscious of those sounds if I had been in Lindisfarne in the 7th century? How does that fit in? How did I listen uh, at that time? And it raises some fascinating issues as to what we put together and where the boundaries of our art might are. This has brought home even more strongly by another project uh, called the Virtual Pools Cross Project, which is a digital recreation of John Dunn's Gunpowder Day Sermon in 1622, where you can see the physical space where the sermon took place, but also explore its acoustic properties. And if you've got two hours to spare, listen to John Dunn's whole sermon. Um, uh, I wasn't proposing to pay you all of that, but. Uh, you can listen to some of it. And again, it, it raises issues about how do we document that kind of reconstruction? Where do we put the assumption? How do we best archive the assumption we built into that reconstruction? Is our reaction to the reconstruction that really that would have been there if we had been members of John Dunn's audience? Um, uh, I think I'm far more conscious of the sounds of the birds and the sounds of the horses. And maybe I would have been if I'd have been there in 1622. So again, it raises issues about our boundaries and what, as historians, as literary scholars, we're doing here and what the forms of expression are going to be. And my thinking of this, my final example, so I will see if we can get this one going. Let's see if we can get Mark 5 up. Um, ooh, that looks hopeful actually. Let's see what happens. I'll explain first, in my concluding piece, is that when I was first in Glasgow a few years ago, I uh, came across a sound artist called Mark Vernon, whose work I like very much. And you can explore his work at meganresource.com. And uh, Mark found um, in Skip a lot of archives of Leicester and Derby tape clubs. Um, in the 60s and 70s, um, when the magnetic tape recorders Apparently, rare thing. Um, uh, a very popular hobby was actually developing programs um, on tape and, and then exchanging tape between different clubs. And they, these, these had a certain amount of interest in themselves. First, as a record of technology, um, I think very interesting as a different type of technology. Second, they do actually record some uh, events of, of general interest. The tape, for example, the Festival of Britain in 1951. But for me, um, what's particularly interesting, as somebody interested in social and cultural history, is their resonance as uh, a postcard almost from a lost suburban culture, um, a lost culture of clubs and societies, which maybe we don't have now, but was very important in the earlier part of the 20th century. Um, as part of the fabric of places like Nottingham. So if I'm thinking about Nottingham, I want to think about things like this. And Marx produced a series of programs which mix up um, some of these tapes, and they're very entertaining listening. The question for me is, how can you actually, there's clearly something of interest there, how can I integrate that into a historical discourse? How can I fit that in? And it's actually dealing with those issues of different types of media uh, and so on. It's going to be very um, important. So I, 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 that's all I'm going to, to say. What I'll try and do is to get Mark going here, because it will be lovely for you to be finished with this. Oh, yeah, here we go. The Nostrum and Tape Recording Club. Right?
Yes, this is Jeff Weissel speaking, great actor and Cape Cod psychiatrist. You would love to know that Kiltred and I are in marvelous time here in the neighborhood. They would tell me that, of course, but nevertheless, it's not too bad. Next season, we have a host of good things planned for Cape Cod enthusiasts. So why not contact me, Jack Weissel, 51 Marlborough Beast. I'll repeat that. Jack Weissel, 51 Marlborough Beast. Anyone who's interested in taking recording the world in the club. It's all good stuff, folks. Hope to see some of you at our meetings. See you then. Yes, we'll keep the disc rolling, bro. Just hold the level on now. At the end of this phrase, Peter, please. Four. Stand by to take the music out. Start the fade now. Four. Okay, Peter. Now. Just keep the music on the background. Now, just keep the music on now, just pop the thing. The thing has to be used. Sorry, Stand for British Federation of Takeouts. And I discovered something quite important. The intervention by the government will affect the old future course of business take recording. Since I have managed to keep the content of this tape secret, and therefore free from censorship, until this moment, you will appreciate that this is a unique opportunity. A chance to expiate my guilt as one of the two founder members of the club, by taking off the lid and revealing the unsavoury truth, normally hidden behind the sun of respectability. I'll let you uh, consider what the unsavoury truth. You want to explore some more of Mark's programmes. Um, they're available all available. On his website. So, those are my thoughts for the day. Thank you very much for your attention.